This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Hi. We're going to finish this session by looking at three standards that you met when you studied financial reporting. So these are all revision. Um, sometimes, though, they are the ones that people tend to forget. So please follow through carefully. The first thumb word that we're taking a look at is IES 23, which is borrowing costs. As a reminder, why was this standard invented? It was all about the matching concept. When you, if you've got a building, you could buy one, a ready-made building from a house builder or a property builder, in which case the price you pay would include the materials, labour, the suppliers, interest costs, and so on. If you decide to self-build, so organise your own building, then you have to accumulate all your own costs together. Those costs would include your materials, your labour, but it would also include your finance costs on the assumption, again, that this project was financed either from a specific loan or from your borrowings in general. So IES 23 requires that when you have a building or something like that that's going to take you maybe a year to complete, that alongside the other costs, the finance costs should be added to the cost of the asset. That makes the cost of the asset bigger. Eventually, of course, that will wash out through the profit and loss when the asset is actually depreciated. It's a very sensitive issue because if you're not showing the finance costs as finance costs but adding them to the cost of the assets, investors may be confused about the amount of interest the business is actually paying. That's why the cash flow statement is important because if they want to know what we're paying, that's what they'd look at rather than the profit and loss. So as a reminder of the rules here, so the key rule is that borrowing costs on qualifying assets, those are assets that take a substantial period of time to get ready, so a year or something like that, must be capitalised over the period of construction. And construction starts, of course, when you actually start building. It stops when you stop building. And, of course... Um, if there's a strike or something in the middle, again, that capitalization would be paused. So as it says further down in the note, it stops when the asset is now ready for use. So the builders move out. That's when you actually stop. When you come to look at financial instruments, which you may not have studied yet, you'll see various interest rates knocking around. The one that you need, if you see this jargon, is the effective rate. There's probably only one interest rate in the question, but if there's more than one, look for the word effective. But that will become clearer when you've studied financial instruments. We've got a little example here called Columbia. So pause the recording, have a read of Columbia, and have a go at it just before you listen to the debrief. If I attempt to draw a timeline, though it probably won't be to scale because my timelines never are, so they start building it on the 1st of March. So, 1st of March, they stop, well, at the year end, it's the 31st of December. March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, so that's 10 months. But unfortunately, it says there's a strike from the 1st of October to the 1st of November. Disgraceful. So there's here, there is a one month strike. So that means that actively building, therefore, for nine months. 
The question is, what would I capitalize? Well, I would therefore capitalize, in other words, add to the cost of the building. It's nine months, we've just established that. So nine twelfths, the interest rate given is 5% times 0.05 or 5%, however you prefer to express it, or 5 over 100 times the amount of the loan and the amount of the loan was 10 million. So if I extend that, that's going to give me, just watch your decimals if you're in millions, 0.375 million dollars. And that's the amount of interest to capitalize. You may not see that come up or very rarely, but an important little rule. The next standard, revision standard to recap, is grants. You could get a grant from the government, from some central agency like the European Union, if you're based there. You might get a grant from a local authority. Or, of course, you sometimes get grants from suppliers to help you set up a new production line or customers. Now, well, it could be, I guess, from customers, probably. Um, customers might give you a grant at the start or possibly suppliers, but whatever. Either way, you need to match the grant against the related income. So a disgusting thing that some companies might do is to put the grant immediately into the profit and loss. That's disgraceful, isn't it? It needs to go into the profit and loss, applying the matching or accruals concept. So let's see, we've really got two rules, I think. The first one is common sense. And that's to say you certainly can't recognize the grant unless you know you're going to get it. So you have to think about whether you're going to meet any related conditions, if there are any related conditions, you're confident of receiving the grant or not having to repay it back. Otherwise, you can't possibly put it into the profit and loss. Rule two is then effectively to apply the matching concept. So the grant should be recognized so as to spread the income over the period of the related expenditure. It means you'll end up with a residual in the balance sheet. Now, I know it's called Statement of Financial Position, but between us, it's a balance sheet, isn't it? It's a sheet of balances that won't go anywhere else. So there'll be a bit of residual somewhere in the balance sheet. We'll think about that when we look at this little example. An example in practice, a very common example, is that if the grant is to use to buy depreciating assets, if the asset is depreciated over 10 years, the grant would also be matched against it in the PL. So they tend to use the word amortized. It's just jargon, isn't it? The key thing is it will go in the PL over 10 years and not immediately. So the grant would be spread over the same life in the profit and loss. Why not pause the recording and have a read of Tweddle, play with the numbers, and then we'll have a talk about this one. So the cost of the asset is 10 million. Uh, the grant is 2 million. The life of the asset is 10 years. And what we're really thinking about is particularly, I think, how this would be reflected in the profit and loss. I don't want to do it over 10 years, but what we could do is look at the grant over the first year. So in this little example, let's just say... So this is the grant example that we're looking particularly at the P&L, but also at the soft P. If I call this T0, 
T0 is time naught. It's the date you receive the grant and also you buy the asset. T1 is one year later. Let's have a think about what we'd see in the key financial statements. So in the soft P, on the date that you actually buy the property or the machine, you'll have the property on the, or the machine in your books at 10. The grant itself, debit, cash, credit, probably deferred income, somewhere in the liability section of the balance sheet. It's probably easier if I show that in brackets like that. Nothing's actually happening in the profit and loss until the next year starts to unfold. But in the next year, let's look back at this scenario. It's a 10 year life. In the next year, so that's my T1 column, I'm going to have depreciation of the PPE. That's going to be one tenth of 10. So that's going to be a cost in the profit and loss of one. So as a result of that, the PPE will go down in value. 10 minus one is nine. I'll also have in the profit and loss, the amortization of the grant, or if you prefer to call it deferred income. And that will be one tenth of two, which would give me 0.2. So the deferred income would also fall. Oh, I've put the wrong number in for deferred income, haven't I? Who's a naughty boy? The deferred income was two. Sorry about that. Right, we'll try that again. So one tenth of two. So that would therefore give me, uh, therefore, 1.8 in the soft P. So running that again, the PPE starts at 10, the deferred income starts at two. Over the next year, the PPE is depreciated by a tenth and the grant is amortized by a tenth. So the PPE falls to nine, deferred income falls to 1.8. So that's matching the grant against the related expense in the profit and loss. So in the profit and loss, you can see that the overall cost is 0.8. That's the overall cost of the business. Where would you put it? Well, if it was the factory, I suppose the net cost would go into cost of sales. If it was the um, offices, I guess the net cost would end up somewhere in operating expenses. But there we are with grants. Now, what else have we got? Um, investment properties is the next one which again is revision. So people often get into a little bit of a muddle about this. So we need to revise this quite carefully. If you've got a building, if you are a sausage business, if you are using the building to make your sausages, stuff your sausages, sell your sausages or administer your sausages, it's PPE. If you're not using the building for sausage making, if you're letting it out to someone completely independent, it's not PPE, is it? It's an investment property, which is dealt with under different rules. So here's a reminder, investment property is land or building. You're either renting it out or you're just one of those people that waits for the price to go up. It's how you do your business. So in city centres, of course, then um, that's very widespread. People would buy the, the big property companies would buy the properties and then rent them out. However, 
It's not, of course, the point in the black box. It's not being used by you, in which case it would be PPE. And you're not selling it. If you were a house builder, it would be inventory. So you're definitely using it to let out to other parties. Now, like regular PPE, initially measured at cost, plus things like legal costs, this standard gives a choice of subsequent measurement, but the one that is by far the normal one, and the one that I would normally expect to see in the exam and life, is that normally they deal with investment properties under the fair value model. That means there'll be a revaluation, which so in PPE, revaluation is actually quite rare, but they can do it. Investment properties, if you go down this route, you revalue and notice you revalue every single year. You don't depreciate because you're not really using the property in a depreciating way. You're not using it to stuff your sausages. That's the argument. The point that people often get wrong is that unlike PPE, gains and losses, again, are recognised through profit and loss. So gains and losses do not go to OCI. I'll say that again. They do not go to OCI. I'll say it again. They do not go to OCI. They go to profit and loss. So that's the point that people are always getting wrong. Again, so you might say, well, is that sensible? Well, different commentators have different views. I think the logic in IES 40 was that if that's how you make your living by getting rental income and capital appreciation, if that's how you make your daily bread, perhaps that's what you should recognise in the P&L. Either way, don't fight it. Please got the gain in the profit and loss and all will be well. Now, sometimes the business might have PPE and then they decide later to move out and rent the business out or vice versa. So in practice, you can have transfers into and out of investment property. The one that you really understand, because there's a number of possibilities there, is this one here. So the one that is important, the one that's most likely is the third one down. And that is where you're using the building to stuff your sausages. And then you decide to stuff them elsewhere. You start to rent the building out. And then we say, well, how do we treat this? Again, the key thing, of course, is where do gains go? Where do valuation gains go? Again, um, do they go in OCI? Do they go investment property? That's because most companies recognize PPE under the cost model and investment property under the valuation model. So that can cause a muddle. Please pause the recording. Have a read of, invest, of um, example six. Maybe have a tinker with the numbers. Notice that the change of use happens halfway through the year, then restart and I'll talk through this scenario. So we're going to look at this change of use example. There we go. You can see it was using it as head office. So it was PPE. And then they decided to lease the property out. In other words, they were renting it to someone else. So they start to use it. So they are actually now, again, renting the property out. They've moved out and moved somewhere else. So here it's PPE. And there, it's now investment property. They're acting as lessor. Again, you may not have revised the lessor session yet. But lessor is the person who owns the asset and rents it out. So they were using it, they're now renting it out. You can see the change takes place 
on the 1st of July 15. That's halfway through that year. And then we've got various valuations. So we'll work our way through this. Easiest way is perhaps just to do a big working down the page. So example six here on investment property. The brought down value on the 1st of January, on the 1st of January, the carrying amount was 20 million. So that's fine. There's the brought down value of 20. It's still PPE at this stage. So it will now be depreciated for six months. So six twelfths. Let's have a look at the useful life. The useful life is 20 years times 1 20th times 20, the carrying amount. So that would give me depreciation of 0 0.5. And again, so the carrying amount at the end of the year or sorry, the end of the six months, the 1st of July, is 19.5. This expense here would go to profit and loss as normal. It's now going to change category. So here it's PPE, here it's PPE, but like a caterpillar that goes to bed and wakes up the next morning, when it wakes up the next morning, it's going to be an investment property. Remember that generally investment properties are always carried at fair value. And when it wakes up in the morning, the value of that investment property is 21, my age. So 21 is the investment property value on that day. So that means there is therefore a gain on that revaluation. The question is, where should that gain go? 1.5. That is a balancing figure. Should we show that gain in profit and loss? Well, you could imagine if you had the building for like a hundred years and then rented it out, the historic cost would be way out of date. So actually you'd end up with a substantial gain. That's why IES 40 coming back to the rules further up the notes here says revalue the initial revaluation must be under IES 16. In other words, it will go to revaluation reserve. So this revaluation gain here, the 1.5, will not go to profit and loss. It will go to revaluation reserve. So whilst it's PPE, it will tend to, or OCI, it will tend to be held under the cost model. It's just how most PPE is recognised. Later on in the year, the valuer says, don't they, this is right at the end of the year, it's 21.6 million. Where's that valuation going? Well, you know the answer, don't you? Investment property gains usually go to profit and loss. So now this is an investment property. Here we are six months later on the 31st of December. It's still an investment property. The valuer says it's 21.6. That means there's a further gain. The further gain, the balancing figure, the 0 0.6 would then go to profit and loss. If they change their mind, they're not going to, are they? That would just be silly. And then to actually move back in, they'll bring it back into PP at that valuation, um, which is a point you can sort of see further up the page here. 
um, if they go in the other direction, then you just transfer it back at the fair value and start to depreciate it again. But um, it's not very likely, is it? I don't think the company would be that schizophrenic. In terms of investment properties, just coming back to the notes for a minute, I think sometimes we see the word, I hold some property as an investment, then we immediately say that investment property, just be careful and read it, read the question. So if you own it and let it out on a commercial rent, it's definitely investment property. If you plan to sell it, it's inventory. If you're occupying it, it would be PPE. One of the issues is what happens if it's something like a hotel. Now the question is, is a hotel PPE or is it investment property? And in almost, I mean, we've all stayed in some dreadful hotels, I know, but in almost all cases, you do get some extra services because the cleaners will come in they will come in and change your bed. They might put a chocolate on your pillow or whatever. So essentially, again, normally a hotel would be PPE. A block of flats would be investment property because you don't see the landlord. I think with the hotel, they're around every day, snooping around. As it says, any services to tenants must be inconsequential. So if they're giving you a three-course meal... I guess it's um, it's PPE. The last point, again, if you've not looked at leasing yet, won't make much sense. But um, with there's a type of lease for the lessor called finance lease, in which case it's shown as lease receivable, not investment property. Don't worry about that. You can look back at that point when you come to study leasing. So what we've done there is to revise... Um, government grants, capitalisation of interest, and finally, the rules on investment properties. They're all important rules. The one that tends to come up an awful lot is investment properties. That's it for that session.